Hello good people and welcome back into another Parry This Arthurian Legend video. Today we will be discussing Sir Dagonet, one of the lesser known yet notable members of the Brotherhood of the Round Table. This character is by far the strangest in this series, and that is for a number of reasons. For one thing, there is very limited information about this knight, as he is not utilized much in any of the primary sources, those sources being Geoffrey of Monmouth's Historia Regum Britanniae, Chrétien de Troyes, Eric and Enid, Lancelot, Percival, and Yvain, and of course Sir Thomas Mann Mallory's Le Mort to Darthur, these works being what many Arthurian scholars, myself included, consider primary. And unlike many knights, he isn't even really expanded upon in the best secondary Arthurian sources, such as Alfred Tennyson's Idols of the King and T.H. White's The Once and Future King. And what little references we do have of him often contradict each other. However, I have compiled what I know and I will relay it to you now. So for starters, there are typically two ways that Dagonet is presented. The first is simply as a knight of the round table who is foolish. In these versions, he is a normal knight, but makes lots of jokes, perhaps isn't too sharp, and does foolish things. The other way of depicting him is as King Arthur's official court fool, who was knighted by King Arthur, either as a reward for some act of courage or bravery, or more often as a joke. Ironically, the worst way to depict him, which is the last one I mentioned, and it seems to be the most commonly used one. The reason I do not like this version of the story is that it's one thing to knight someone as a joke, but it's a whole other thing to make him a member of the Brotherhood of the Round Table, which Sir Dagonet certainly was. So personally I find it hard to justify that King Arthur would have made his court fool one of his 15 sworn brothers as a goof. In any case, Sir Dagonet first appears in the early 13th century Vulgate Cycles Lancelot. In here, he is interchangeably referred to as Dagonet the Fool or Dagonet the Coward. In this tale, he is depicted as a lousy knight that people constantly make fun of. So in this earliest tale, he was not the court jester, but a very foolish knight, whose prowess was was much less than that of the rest of the round table. It is, however, in this telling that we get possibly the most interesting tale regarding Sir Dagonet. It just so happened that one day, as Dagonet was riding along outside of Camelot, he would come across a dazed and confused Lancelot. Lancelot would be bemused and daydreaming while riding his horse, and would be so out of it that he would almost be drowned as his horse would lead him into a river without him even noticing. Dagonet would witness this and would seize the reins of Lancelot's horse. Noticing the stupor that Lancelot was in, Dagonet would lead him back to Camelot and declare that he had captured Lancelot, and Lancelot, still daydreaming, would say nothing to challenge the claim. This would all happen in front of most of the court, including Arthur himself, Gawain, Kay, Bedivere, and even the Queen Guinevere. Guinevere would of course storm off angrily as everyone else laughed at Lancelot, for it is one thing to be a fool, but it is much worse to be taken in by a fool. And this event would often be used as a punchline later to depict Lancelot as one who was captured by the most witless of knights. On another occasion, a French knight named Sir Brunor Lenoir saved Guinevere from a lion, and used it as an opportunity to gain enough notoriety to challenge the knights of King Arthur's court to a duel. This was, after all, common practice, as beating a member of the round table earned a knight respect, fame, and sometimes even a spot at King Arthur's court. King Arthur had heard of the strength of Sir Brunor, and considered sending one of his two best knights, these being Lancelot and Gawain, to challenge him. However, not wanting to dignify the French upstart, Arthur's seneschal, Sir Kay, suggested another course of action, so they decided to send Sir Dagonet to challenge the French knight. Of course, Sir Brunor would easily defeat the hapless Dagonet, and would declare loudly his triumph. However, when Dagonet was revealed, Brunor understood the insult that had been given him. His challenge meant so little to the court of King Arthur and the Round Table that a fool was sent as a response. Brunor would be so ashamed and embarrassed by not only this, but also his braggadocious manner after his victory, that Sir Brunor would leave Britain forever and would not trouble Camelot again. One time at Arthur's court, Sir Tristram temporarily went mad and became violent and attempted to leave the court. King Arthur wanted him restrained, but Lancelot and Gawain, the only two knights capable of doing so, were not at court. So none of Arthur's knights were sent to stop Tristram as he left, to prevent unneeded loss of life. However, unfortunately, Dagonet would cross paths with him by accident, and seeing the strange manner, would bar Tristram's way and attempt to find out what was wrong. Having no time for Dagonet's Tom Foolery, Tristram would go into a rage and beat Dagonet within an inch of his life before several of Arthur's knights would see what was happening and intercede to stop the beating. Tristram would then flee Camelot and Dagonet would be healed over time. He would not hold a 
grudge against Tristram for the beating, as he understood it was a result of his madness. But he would also not spend time alone with him again after this date. And it is said that this beating instilled a manner of madness in Dagonet that he would carry for the rest of his life. Of course, there is also the time that King Mark of Cornwall, a cowardly villain prominently featured in most tales concerning Sir Tristram, attacked five knights of King Arthur's court while out on the road. These knights were Sir Kay, Sir Gawain, Sir Dinadan, and Sir Gareth, and of course, Ywain the Bastard. This, of course, was a formidable force, as these five were amongst Arthur's greatest, and therefore, some of the best knights of the age. However, King Mark had a force of nearly 50 knights and men-at-arms, and had attacked them unprovoked in an ambush. The battle would have likely gone ill if two things had not occurred. The first was, as a joke, as is often the case with Dagonet, Sir Dagonet was dressed up in Sir Mordred's armor and sent forth on a quest from Camelot. He would come across this combat and ride into the fray. This, however, would have likely accomplished very little, if it had not been for the quick thinking of Sir Kay. Upon seeing the knight, and not knowing rightly who it was, for he recognized the armor of Mordred, but this knight was broader and taller than he, Sir Kay would cry out in a loud voice for everyone to hear, We are saved, for look, here comes mighty Lancelot. Hearing this, and remembering Lancelot's promise to kill him if he harmed Tristram, which by this time King Mark had, King Mark jumped off of his horse and ran as fast as he could into the woods, where he didn't stop running for a day and a night. His men would mostly flee in all directions, and those who hadn't would be defeated. Later, it would be revealed that the knight whom King Mark had so cowardly fled from was in fact Sir Dagonet, and in shame, King Mark would not show his face in or near Camelot again. However, there are also examples of Sir Dagonet that do not come from him being a punchline. One time, an evil man named Hellier of Thorn would sneak into Camelot and seize the wife of Dagonet and ride off with her in the night. It is unknown whether or not this was a targeted attack or simply a random kidnapping designed to extract ransom, because there would not be enough time to find out. Upon learning of his wife's abduction, Dagonet would set out immediately and would track down the villain. Upon finding Hellier's castle, he would slay the guards at the gate and enter. Without speaking to anyone else, he would enter the Lord's Hall, incapacitate the guards inside, and would stride the length of the hall without saying a word. He would ascend the dais, and as Hellier drew his sword and prepared to challenge Dagonet, Dagonet would bring up his sword and slash downward, decapitating the villain in a single strike. He would then free his wife, who was being held in a tower cell, and the two would leave and return to Camelot. By the time they had returned, Dagonet was back to his normal self, laughing and jesting to comfort his still shaken wife. He would never mention or boast of these actions again, but most of the court would become aware of what had happened. When questioned by the only man who could compel him to speak of it, that being King Arthur himself, Dagonet would confess that some form of madness must have overtaken him, as he remembered nothing until the return journey with his wife. On another occasion, Dagonet would potentially play a heroic role. It was during the reign of the false Guinevere, who was actually just Morgan Le Fay in disguise, that Dagonet would indirectly save Camelot. At this time, Arthur and many of his knights were away, fighting in one of his many wars. Morgan le Fay would come to Camelot and would imprison Guinevere, who was ruling in Arthur's stead, and would disguise herself as the queen and rule in her place. Sir Dagonet was one of the few men loyal to Arthur that remained back at court, and would take over administration of the household. In a very short amount of time, he would bankrupt the household, giving out many loans to people all over Camelot, and seemingly spending the entire treasury on nothing in particular. Noticing this, Foal, the treasurer, would confront Dagonet, calling him a traitor, and asking him why he did not also sell King Arthur's crown while he was at it. Enraged by the accusation, Dagonet would actually kill the treasurer. When Arthur would eventually return, Dagonet would open the gates wide for his king and welcome him home. With no money for mercenaries, Morgan le Fay was unable to achieve her plan of open war against Arthur, and was forced to reveal herself and flee when he returned. Dagonet would find and free the true Guinevere, and would retrieve all of Arthur's wealth, which he had hidden by giving it to many of Arthur's loyal servants and subjects to hide it from the false queen. Apparently, it took very little time at all for Dagonet to realize something was wrong in Camelot, and knowing he could not save it for Arthur through strength of arms, he instead acted the fool and saved Camelot using only his wits. The last tale to include Dagonet comes near the end of Arthur's reign. At this point, adultery, corruption, factions, and treason have all but destroyed Camelot. In the tale known as The Last Tournament, Sir Dagonet is the only man at court who foresees the doom of Camelot. In this tale, he mocks the faithless knights who have broken their vows in one way or another, and openly declares that although he and Arthur could hear the music of God's plan, they could not. It is at this time that Merlin would actually return to Camelot, and would be shocked and astounded at the state of the once great court. He would not reveal himself to anyone in his true form, not even Arthur's few remaining true and loyal knights such as Sir Gawain and Sir Bedivere. He would, however, reveal himself to Dagonet, calling out to him, Sir friend, Sir Dagonet, please pray for me. The two would discuss what had become of Camelot, and would conclude that it could not be saved at this point. Merlin would resolve to leave once and for all. This 
this time for good. And Dagonet would say that he wished to leave the court as well, and pursue a simple life. Merlin would tell Dagonet that he wouldn't mind his company, and the two would leave together, never to be seen again in Camelot. Thus, after the eventual war between Arthur and Lancelot, and finally the eventual treachery of Mordred, ending in the destruction of Camelot, Dagonet would remain one of the few knights of Arthur that would survive and live out his days in peace. There are also other scattered mentions of Dagonet throughout Arthurian legend, one of which is actually in one of Gawain's quests, where he would disguise himself to quest anonymously, and on this quest he would ironically take the title of Sir Dagonet. This would earn Dagonet some temporary reputation, until it was revealed that the Great Knight was of course the famous Gawain. And there are also tales of how cowardly Dagonet actually was, and in these he would flee in battle, and not fight anyone, but would actually batter his own shield to give the appearance that he had fought in battle. But no matter the case, it is decently consistent that Dagonet was truly beloved of King Arthur. In most tales, he was the closest friend of the king, and always among his most trusted knights and advisors. And despite being disliked by some members of Arthur's court, namely Sir Kay, for his foolishness, he was for the most part loved and protected by all of Arthur's knights, despite how often they would use him in their jokes. His arms were depicted as either a golden sword and a white shield on a black field, or as bearing a cockerel's head.